Okay, we're back. Podcast is on episode 15. 15. Is it 15? We've run the numbers. We've run the numbers. We've collected the data. We've done the research. We're on episode 15 of getting on the podcast here with you guys. We're about two months into having a podcast, period. I feel like it's been a lot longer for some reason. Or maybe we've only been putting them out for like two months. Yes, come. Our boy Jack behind the lens. Oh. Bringing us. Yeah. Delicious. What is this? Bubbly water. Ice cold. We need like a full time drink sponsor for the podcast. Yeah. If you've got a bubbly water source out there, hit us up. Anything. Big advocates of bubbly water. Um, so update on what, uh, what's been going on, what we're doing home, a quick stint at home right now. Ko and I just got back from Tahiti a bit ago. And basically this is how we've run our summer programs for the last 20 years is, um, having a base somewhere and then setting, um, setting up and waiting, replenishing on boards, which actually there's a, this will feed right into a question I saw in the comments, but um, replenishing on boards and gear before the next strike mission because um, the waves we surf are usually heavy. We usually break gear. Um, I ripped my wetsuit in Australia or we broke boards in Tahiti or whatever happens. And so now we are eyeballing currently. We've got eyes on of Porto, Porto Escondido. Eyes swell. on the globe, <laughs> wherever is going to get swell next. Another thing about the boards, you were saying how like we got to restock boards when we come home. Not only do we break them, but a lot of times places we go, we, we give them away yeah. to the locals. Yeah. And I, I don't know how Paisel feels about that, but it's, it's tough not to, you know, like us being so fortunate and lucky to travel to their place no matter where it is. And yep. you see, I mean, it's, it's crazy because a lot of places we do go, it's, it's not the wealthiest places most of the time yeah and you see a lot of kids that are just like riding like a boogie board standing on a boogie board or like a cooler top and you're like dude i gotta give this kid a surfboard they're so surf hyped um, yeah because usually like it's um some of these countries we're talking about there's there's just not the resources the infrastructure or the money there's no one shaping boards there right but there's an insane wave and yeah. these kids are growing up um, they're in like fishermen families or whatever they're doing in the area. And they're seeing us or people like us come in and surf these waves. And they're like, damn, like I want to do that. But they don't have boards. So it's always nice to be able to leave a board behind, a pair of trunks, a rash guard, anything that we have sparingly and we can, we're just fine to give away. It, it's, it's nice to give it away when, when we want, but there is certain places where like, does get like where like people expect to be given stuff yeah that yeah. have you know they already have like not talking about like the super poor countries but there is places where people are just like you're bored like give it and you're like uh well, i might maybe just give it to the grom that didn't ask for it that way <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's funny how that works huh yeah because you know the person that's like asking aggressively is maybe trying to get that board to sell it that's exactly it so like, like and you're like i want to give this to someone that's gonna be psyched and use it yeah who doesn't have access to it. Yeah. So, Paisel, your boards are going to a good cause. Yeah. And our sponsors, clothing, backpacks, stickers. Like, I usually, le like, I left Tahiti with one surfboard in my bag, and I only brought that surfboard home because I absolutely love the 80s design on it. Yeah. So, I couldn't, I was like, if I break it, okay, I'm going to leave it. Someone asked for it if they could have it as art. I think Dom. Yeah. Because it's so cool, but I was like... If I didn't just absolutely love the design, I would have brought it home. But I left, I left everything else I had there. That's usually the case, right? As you get emotionally, like if you, if you, if you say you are one of those people that you're like, oh, I wish I would give up a board. If if it's not happening, it's probably because we've become emotionally connected to a board, which yeah. everyone can relate to. If you're a surfer, there's certain boards you connect to, and you you're like, this is my baby. I don't want to like, it's my magic one. Like I'm yeah. so sorry. I want to like give you, but. I can't give this one out because it's like, I feel like I need it for the next strike mission. Yeah. Magic boards are funny because it's like a surfer, like, like you said, surfer, like everyone who surfs and has been surfing for a long time has their like magic surfboard. Mm -hmm. And it's a magic surfboard is a board that just works so good that you almost don't even want to ride it because you're scared of breaking it. Yep. Because it's like a curse. Once you find a board that you just absolutely love, 
like I'm sure a lot of the CT guys and John, if they ride a board and they're like, this is the best board ever, they'll just put it aside till a contest. They, I've heard John referencing it, putting it on ice. Yeah, put it on they'll ice. Ride it one time or however it takes to realize like, hey, this is something super special and help put it on ice or just put it away and not ride it until a heat situation. Yeah. So they end up where they've collected a bunch of different boards that are A++ that they're only going to use when they want to surf their absolute best without risk of breaking it in a free surf session, and that's going to be in competition. It's, it's funny how surfboards, you look at all other sports, like anything like from snowboarding to tennis to biking to all that all their equipment is perfect yeah like not saying surfboards aren't perfect but you look at like a tennis racket i think ever like pretty much every time you pick get a brand new tennis racket it's going to be the same yep whereas surfboards you can get copies and copies of surfboards and they still will come out feeling a bit different it's the it's human error like um, or just the human touch, right? Most of those other sports, those are printed in a machine or made in a machine, which can replicate identical versions of itself. Snowboards, tennis rackets, baseball bats. But on a surfboard, you have a person. Like the blank might be cut down to a, a model type, but then even then, the sh- shaper comes in and he personally hand shapes it, and so it causes like magic boards we made but it's also frustrating because you might never get that board the same again you might never get that magic board just like the one you had before can i please get an identical version of this probably not gonna happen you can get close but it's just it's just the whatever magic the shaper worked on that specific day he might not be able to replicate well well not only that they shape the surfboard so it goes through a bunch of hands so, like, the shaper gets it probably from the machine, which cuts it enough for them to, like, shape it perfectly. And then it goes to someone who's going to glass it. So, another glasser who's, who's got to put the right amount of glass on or fiberglass and resin. And then it goes to a sander. So, there's, like, three people touching each surfboard or, like, modifying each surfboard yeah. to create a surfboard. So, yeah, it's cl- clearly there's going to be some human error. but But you look at... Like a, like the same thing with like fire wires and stuff, right? Aren't those machine made like in a vacuum? Mm-hmm. And people still say the same thing about those. Yeah. It must just be like having to ride something that is detached from you. Yeah. And dealing with the ocean because there's so much going on. And they're, I feel like they're like sensitive to heat. One could have cured yeah. in a different yeah, level of right. heat than another one. And so you're the right. fiberglass or the epoxy or the um, carbon, if it's made out of that, may just have a little bit different flex than the other one. Yeah. Or like the wood stringer. I mean, is it all the yeah. same exact wood stringer? Like, probably not. So, like, every board has a little, like, uniqueness to what, it. What is this? I need that same wood I need from mahogany. that blank. <laughs> <laughs> I, need that, I need that oak wood stringer. <laughs> <laughs> I won't take sandalwood. <laughs> Dude, speaking of surfboards and Pizel, finally, after five years, so Pizel good. has made, if you guys have been following my YouTube channel or whatever, Instagram, anything, um, I've been talking about a breadstick forever. I finally got the first breadstick ever. So it's my custom model from Pizel, and he's only allowed to make me 20 for you guys out there. So if you want one, Go get one. They're going to be on my website. This is Livin's website. But if it goes really good, it might be a complete model. So it's been a you long... Gotta, you got to help Co sell these out so that you can make it a complete they model. they got to sell out. So <laughs> if they do good... I mean, they're an expensive brand new surfboard. So yeah. if you can, yeah. please support it. The breadstick has been in the making for literally five years now. And it's, it's a new model. It looks really sick. It's a brand new model. It yeah. feels really good. I have yet to try it. I'm going to put out a YouTube video, like putting it together, riding it. The, it's like... The breadstick logo, because I went and made stickers uh-huh. <laughs> for people that wanted to cover his logos, and the breadstick logo is under the glass, like a proper model. Yeah. So it's like, wow. It's really good. Finally paid off. I, I never gave up. It took so long. Five years. I don't think he wanted to do it. I think his team was like, why aren't we doing this yeah. for this long? And he was finally like, fine, I'll just do it. <laughs> but you have to sell them. I'm only giving you 20. They're not even going to be on his website. They're yeah. just like custom 
on mine. So we still haven't even figured out the details, but there's only 20 out there. I think it's going to go super well, and Pizel is going to be pleasantly surprised, and it will hopefully be a model. Dude, I don't know. He's like, I think he gets so much joy out of like hating against it. I know. That, so resistant. And he does so well with surfboards. <laughs> didn't, didn't you make a model with him, the tank or something? Yeah. I, I, it was a similar thing. I was like, um, it was like a beefed up sure. next step. I wanted a next step with a ton more volume so you could go shorter on the length, uh, but have the volume like, um, to be able to paddle still. So basically like what now is kind of turning into also like a slab model for boards and then the tank, it was the same thing. I got, um, I rallied my followers to request the tank when they called in for a custom board. And then I guess like a ton of people called him and were like, I want the tank model. And he's like, that's not a model. And they're like, but Nathan said he has a tank model. <laughs> and so he just started making them for people. That's so funny. But he never really like promoted it um, or marketed it that way. But I, I, that's like, it's just, he's so funny because it's such a great way to market surfboards is the people following you or me and then the boards we're riding and what we're doing. And they're obviously specifically interested in what we're doing and they want boards for that. And I'm, so, I mean... I'm going to go out on a limb here and say me and you might sell just as many surfboards, maybe together as John John. Yeah. That's a big limb. That's a small <laughs> limb. But the limb might break. <laughs> <laughs> that, little, that, that little quote was for Paisel. Mm -hmm. We got to get him on here and attack him. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that... I guess like we covered a lot of part of the question was like wait what question uh I was lost I said in the beginning there was a question I saw on one of the podcasts and it was just oh. around boards exactly like we were explaining is like what like say a normal trip how many boards do we break um how many boards do we take on a trip and then how long does it take for us to get our boards from when we call and make the order to getting those boards to being ready to go back on the trip. So this is funny because making a surfboard, I've recently found out, t is way quicker than yeah. we were, th we thought it took. Yeah. Like I thought like, oh, two weeks, yeah. fast as you can make a surfboard. And then we got Paisel on the podcast. He's like- He revealed to us. Um, I, I can make it in a day. I'm like, what? <laughs> News to us. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I thought these boards have taken two weeks to make. Yeah. But- uh. That when he was making the breadstick, he's like, I'm making you a breadstick. Because the guy who makes my stickers in the, is in the same uh, warehouse as him. Oh, got it. And he made the breadstick in two days. That's and I was insane. Like, oh, here it is. He's like a brand new model. I just put it together. Never before seen Paisel model. That was your, that was your mistake, Paisel. Because now we know <laughs> now how we fast know you can make surfboards. How quick surfboards can actually But I guess if it does take long, it's probably because he's backed up on orders. I could see how orders yeah. can stack up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so say you... Okay. Well, they can only make so many. Yeah, that too. But as an example, like, they're making the boards for the shop, but they're making the boards for the team rider. And say just you alone, we'll give an example of winter. Winter's coming around and you want your quiver set. Like, how many boards is that, really? I order, like, 18. Right? Or more, yeah, so throughout the winter. So 18 boards need to be shipped for, or shaped for one team rider and the amount of blanks they have on island and all that. So we, we can see how it can take a while, but obviously when we order boards, we want ours on that priority shipping. We want the next day <laughs> delivery. I know, you just expect to be like, hey, I need this, and then just get it tomorrow. <laughs> I you said know, this, it just doesn't happen. a literal text that was like, I want two six O's, two six twos, two six fours, two six sixes, two six eights and i went all the way up to nine o's and you're just like you just you can't order boards like that you That's, need to just let's just go short boards first then step ups then guns but i was like okay, okay so i'll calm down you you can but you can't do it through him you have to hit up the shop oh really and have them like write it down and make yeah. the orders like right there on their little weird order sheets but back to bringing surfboards places and how many we, br we bring yeah it really does depend on the trip and where you're going. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, is it going to be a gnarly wave that just eats surfboards? Yep. Or are you going to go for two weeks or a month or a week, you know? So it's just, it varies from like the minimum amount of boards I'll bring somewhere is four. But the max I've brought places is literally like eight or nine. Yeah. Yeah. And totally, it's, it's place dependent. Uh, for for example, if we're going anywhere that's going to have a range of waves from 
um, a beach break to some bigger slab, which is hopefully like the ideal place where we're going to travel to. Um, we're going to be bringing two shortboards because you need a backup as a shortboard and you probably only need one, but you break one and then you're stuck surfing a small wave on a step up. It just, it can be annoying. So you got two shortboards. You got two mid-size boards as far as step up. Like for me, this is just personal. I'm bringing two shortboards, two six twos. And then depending on the wave, I'll bring like two six sixes, um, which seems like, like in my head when I say that, I, I'm like, that doesn't feel even enough. Like I'll be stressing, yeah. but that's six boards already. So you guys can see like the stress of packing and thinking, what do I need for this wave? It adds up quickly. And then you got to lug that around. And, and, then, and then it's something like you're going somewhere where there might be a big wave. All of a sudden you have a coffin with six boards and then you got to drag around a board bag that's nine feet long and look at a flight person in the face and tell them that's going to get on the plane. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. no. And you're like, yes, it is. Oh yeah. It it is. <laughs> that is, that's gotta be one of the most frustrating things about being about traveling as a surfer yeah. is dragging these massive board bags around because there's no way around it. You need to bring your surfboards and you need to bring a lot. So you're going through airports, connections, and like customs with just 50 to 90 pound bags. Sometimes two of them you're dragging, not even your clothing or anything else, just surfboards. Yeah. And it just becomes like, it makes traveling because traveling is already stressful and not fun. Like the act of traveling, like getting on a plane, sitting on the flight and then getting off and not only having that flight, but having to go pick up your huge ass heavy board bags and then you're in a hot place and all of a sudden you're just sweating and then you get on another flight and you're just dripping sweat it's just like it's a, it's a disturbing place to be but I, I designed a workout called terminal switch specifically because of all our dragging surfboards around. what what is this workout <laughs> is it, is it with the it i only did it once <laughs> no it was like um it was 21 you know how we do like down by threes 21 18 15, 12, 9, 6, 3 is a rep scheme we like commonly do with different movements. It was rowing and burpees, but it was a 21, ro- no, 21 thrusters, 21 burpees. That's what it was. Those are the two movements. Do those two. Thrusters with how much weight? Uh, 35 pound dumbbells. Okay. And then between each of those, so 21 thrusters, 21 burpees, 200 meter farmer carry with the uh, um, dumbbells. And I just kind of like, Oh, that, that'll go by pretty quick, but it's 21, 18, 15, 12, 9, 6, 3, like six rounds of farmer carries at 200 meters. Bro, <laughs> I, I had my arms were like little claws, <laughs> like my tendons and my forearms like seized up. And I was like literally like this for T-Rex a week. T-Rex arms. I joke every time now Zord, start, he filmed the workout, he starts cracking up when I'm dragging board bags. He's like, you trained for this. <laughs> I'm like, shut up. Fuck. You're all pissed off. Yeah. Overnight flight. He was like, I'm going to kill you, Zord. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. That, that sounds like every single workout I've done with you. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. It's going to be good for this, and it's going to be mellow. It's not that much reps. It's not heavy. You're going to be fine. You're gonna be, your day isn't going to be ruined. And every time we do it, I'm just like, I give up on life. <laughs> it I is cannot psycho. feel my arms. My legs are shot What you for can days. fit into 10 minutes and how much pain you can inflict oh. upon yourself in 10 minutes is just insane. Eli... For like the first time in years, first he he worked out with us that one time and he it was box jumps. He jumped and tripped and rolled his ankle on the box jump. He didn't come back for years, bro. Until literally a week ago, he comes to the gym. No, that was that, two days ago. Yeah, that uh, we all train at. <laughs> time is funny here. <laughs> yeah. We're on island time. Yeah, <laughs> he comes and and we do just. The, the most horrific workout. Like, I've been wobbling for two days. Dude, it was so funny because I didn't have time to come work out with you guys. So I went to my dad's to go just um, hit the bag for a little bit. And I walk over there to say hi because I had a meeting I had to go to. And I look in there and they're mid-workout, him and Eli, Nate and Eli. And Nate's, like, doing these wall balls, just looking like he's in pain like he always is when he's doing these crazy workouts. And I go inside into the gym and Eli is, like, 
doing deadlifts. He's like, I can't feel my legs. And he's like <laughs> hanging over the bar, like his legs are on the bar. And he's like, not even a quarter way through the workout. I'm like, dude, just stop. He's like, I know I should. And then he just picks the bar back up. He's like killing himself. Yeah, I, I told him he looked like he aged 10 years. <laughs> his face got so swollen and he had bags under his <laughs> eyes. And I was like, holy smokes, bro. Oh my abort, God. abort. <laughs> Dude, like that meme I sent everyone when you're... When you try to party like you're in your twenties, yep, to our group text. Exactly. But Eli, Eli's thirty, yeah. and we're. Uh, oh no, you're twenty. You're gonna be twenty. Uh, nine. Twenty nine in June next in, month. Yeah, this it might be around when this podcast yeah. drops. But uh, yeah, back to a meme and just whatever. Uh, I was teasing Eli about being thirty and trying to party, and he's just like, it's like ET, like crumpled on like a chair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the, Eli, this is you. ET. Oh, and then I put it on my Instagram. Yeah. I should have been like, that. this is what you look like after Nate's workout. Yeah. If you, Koa runs a memes page. <laughs> yeah, I talk about this follow. all the time. It's the greatest thing ever. It's so funny. I live for memes. We love memes. Um, I guess one last thing on that topic of boards. I, well, I would say people probably wonder, like if there's an average amount of boards we break per trip and there's no number you could put on it. We've both had similar trips where you literally break every single board three the first day and you're just shocked and then oh, through, the through the trip you're just on one of those weird things where you just everything breaks the whole trip and i've also had trips where i've surfed like europe was a great example i surfed all these crazy waves and i didn't break a board the whole trip i That's rode this nice. one epoxy um <laughs> six o that didn't break the whole trip and i rode it at like 10 different slabs i was tripping on it and so it's just really like that's how you get attached to a board when it goes through that with you and then it doesn't break. But uh, just yeah. as easily, I've been on a three-day trip and broken every board I've had. And so it's just that, random chance. You can never really plan for it. That's the worst is when you, when you break all your boards before the main swell you went there for. Mm -hmm. That's happened to all of us, I'm sure, like a ton of times where you're just like all of a sudden you're – you're like, what am I going to do? And then yeah. you have to like scramble and try to borrow boards from people. And then it's just a part of traveling. That is one thing that I love so much about being home during winter time and surfing here is you have your whole quiver. You have your whole quiver right there. You just got to drive down the road because it's North Shore so small. Somewhere is pumping. Yep. And you can break as many boards as you want. And we like, me and Nate both have like 30 surfboards probably ready to go at our houses so it's it's one really nice thing about being home rather than traveling and trying to stress about surfboards yeah. or them not even showing up i've mm -hmm. had that happen too on surf trips because our surf trips a lot of times when we strike swells are so last minute that you only got a a day to get ready sometimes sometimes like 12 hours and just like any luggage delay surfboards can get delayed very easily and if they don't show up like Sometimes you're not surfing or you're just borrowing a you're short borrowing. board from someone. You're not on the board you want to be on, especially in life-threatening conditions. And it's just, it's an absolute nightmare. Nightmare. Um, but I guess you guys are probably wondering too, I, or, or it would just be cool to explain how the relationship with a shaper works with a sponsored athlete as far as how a shaper would sponsor an athlete. Um, Koa and I, like our deal would be set up where Paizo would l wants us on his boards because of the surfing we're doing and the slabs we're chasing, and he knows us well enough to shape the right boards for us and, and trusts us to go out and represent him. And so we would be getting our boards for free as a sponsored athlete, um, and it's kind of on what we want to order. But I've heard yeah. of plenty of different relationships as far as athlete and shaper relationships. Um, some people are on a 50% off thing, and some people are on the other side of the spectrum where – they actually have commissions on boards they sell. I've heard of guys. Oh, I didn't even know that. Like, I, I don't really know um, how much truth there is to it, but I, I'd heard that, like, Dane Reynolds' model with um, his shaper, he had commissions on the boards he sells. Oh, his custom model or just any surfboard? His, his custom model with his shaper. I'm, f I'm spacing on who his shaper is. He has, he's been with his one shaper for a really long time. Um, Channel Island. Yeah, I think so. Almeric? Um, oh, wait. Are they the same? I don't know, but 
I think it's one of those, and I think with a few of their different <laughs> athletes, they had those type of deals. Uh, and can you imagine uh, pitching that to Faisal? <laughs> <laughs> he probably doesn't want us to find out about that. Yeah. No, but if this breadstick goes well, I'm getting commissions. Yeah. So that's so why I need your guys' help out there. Exactly. So with uh, what a was custom it? model, what was it going to say? Like that. Um, I had something funny to say. I have, I have a story about the three dots. What is the shaper's name with the three dots? Channel Island, right? I don't know. One one time, so me and Paisel live right next door to each other. Channel Islands. Okay. Yeah, confirmation from Jack. Uh, he, I show up to his house, and I just have these pair, this pair of fins from Eli because I'm just like super scrambled with fins. Usually, I don't, I don't know what the best fins are. Or I just throw whatever in my surfboard. I show up with those Channel Island fins, um, in his yard checking Rockies, and all of a sudden, I, it's just he just has a can of spray paint. He's just shaking it and he just sprays out the <laughs> Channel Islands. <laughs> I have it on video. On oh my One of my gosh. videos it was so funny. It that was is like, so what are you hilarious. He's <laughs> so fired up. Yeah. He was all pissed so off. So fired up on that. Um, Dude, we should make some merch for the podcast. Yeah, we should. Like some sick stuff. Yeah. What would you guys want out That'd there if you guys bad. are listening or watching? What merch you guys would want from the podcast? T shirts, pop sockets, stickers. Phone case, cases. Um, what else is there? A beer opener. Bottle That's opener. Insane. That's such a fun call. We should start our own alcohol company. We've we've come up with a lot of ideas on here that we haven't really this followed is the idea through farm. with. You re- you written them all down? Um. Oh oh no, this this podcast. Yeah. So we got we got the wave of the winter. We got to complete. That was one of our ideas. Now we need merch and, a, and an alcohol company. <laughs> and what was another one? We had another one. It's um, public on this channel, so you guys go watch all the podcasts again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go watch but ourselves talk Somewhere again. at some point it was captured. <laughs> um, but I have another question here. I, I screenshotted a few because we like to get back to you guys on things you guys are wondering. Um, so... We got a question here from PMK Lings, and it's uh, when you guys take off on strike permissions last minute. What does that process look like? Who is responsible for paying for and booking travel? Do sponsors pay for you and the filmer to travel? How does that work? Thanks in advance. So there's there's a ton of ways that works, and it all depends on like your deal structure with your main sponsor. Yep. So some sponsors will give you just a base pay and no travel budget or some sponsors give you base pay and a set amount you can travel with that you got to re-invoice them for. So it just really depends on your deal structure and if you're allowed to use it on people other than yourself. Yeah. So sometimes people's deals are structured to where they just get like a flat rate. They don't, the company doesn't pay for anything besides what, the athlete, like their monthly pay, I guess. Yeah. But a lot of trips are out of pocket for most surfers, especially when you run out of a travel budget and there's like a crazy swell going somewhere. You're like, I'm not going to not go. Like I'm going to spend my own money to get there if I Mm -hmm. have to, you know? Yeah. So I think in the beginning, at least for me, a lot of it was just like paycheck to paycheck for me because over the years, sponsors it's like grown and grown like our image i guess which becomes more marketable and that comes with more money i'm Mm -hmm. sure the same for you but like i was going to i was still traveling so much with making way less money than i was now and like barely any travel budget like sometimes it'd be like oh we'll pay for one trip or this and that so it just depends on seriously the surfer's deal structure I think it's great that sponsors, I don't see why a sponsor wouldn't want to put the money into travel, Yeah. especially for free surfers or contest surfers, just any surfers, mm-hmm. because people love seeing you go places and surf new waves or mm-hmm. leave your home and go do something cool. So it's like, mar- it's, it's marketing that helps everyone, you know? Yep. I, I totally agree. And similar with me too, as far as. Travel budgets and that I've I've had it seems like travel budgets were more prevalent a few years ago and they're not so much now and that just could be part of what we do now right is because when at first I was like 
hey, pay for, please favor my trip. Like, I'll dedicate the trip to you. I'll get you the content you need uh -huh. and this and that. And then it and then it slowly became like, no, actually, like, I'm going on this trip and I want to own all the content I have. I don't want to have to give over all of this stuff at the end of the trip. I want to divvy yeah. it out how I would like to divvy it out. And so yeah. the brand deals turned to more salary base, which is also nice because just like you said, like, when you have a set travel budget, sometimes from a brand, you they they're like, hey, can you invite us there, right? So me or Koa would book the tickets of ourselves plus Zord or Jack. And then the company's like, invoice us and show us screenshots of those tickets. And then they're like, we got you covered, but we don't got Jack or Zord covered, you know? Because yeah. your name's on it. And they need to take that to the budgeting department and say, hey, this is the budget we have for them and so forth. And so uh, that could get tricky. So at times, you're, it's just almost like, yeah, we can give you a travel budget. And you're like, we'll just put that into my salary and I'll spend that money how I can, how I want to. Yeah, I think I think that's the best deal structure. Like, okay, we're going to give you this amount of pay and then we're going to give you this amount for travel. I'll just be like, can you just put that into my monthly pay like yeah. throughout the year? Mm -hmm. So it's not like, because a lot of places like Tahiti, everything else we paid for besides the flights was all cash. Yep. And companies like, obviously well they have a hard time accepting just like like a handwritten note take my word <laughs> like like yeah do? that like, boat was a thousand dollars i have no receipt and you send them an atm receipt because you hit the atm four times and pull i've done cash. that it's like i've I, wrote down what it's for and sometimes yeah. they're cool and it's just all comes comes down to the it's company. just business i understand it if yeah they're like uh no but but that being said like in the beginning like koa said like brand deals and for those of you maybe you're a young kid or you have a kid coming up and and you're trying to see how you can structure a deal or there's a deal on the table or someone's offering this or that but in the beginning like if a brand wasn't going to pay me but they wanted to work with me sometimes i'd be like fine don't pay me just give me three trips three yeah trips and, uh, and i'll give you some action from those trips and this yeah. was early on when we weren't making much and so that just helps you get on the road right and build your image and build your own brand and use that to use that money, do those trips, give them what they want. But at the same time, you're building up your own image. So the next brand that saw you do that is like, hey, we'll pay for those trips and give you some cash if you come work with us. Yeah. And you're like, let's go. That's some great advice from Nate for whoever's out there trying to make it as a surfer right now. Just take whatever deals you can at first to just be able to... Get, get on the road and build yourself up. Yeah, that's... That's good advice. I see this I see this common thread of like, oh, I don't want so many stickers on my board and, and that's like a sellout trade. And I'm like, bro, what? You do you want to get paid to do what you love or not? Yeah. The sellout thing's funny. We've laughed so much about this. <laughs> yeah. No, I've laughed so much at your surfboards. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, sometimes a company will send me a sticker, I'll be like, like, okay, that's kind of big. Like, do you have any smaller ones to fit my surfboard? I'm not like worried about putting stickers on my board ever, but Nate, if you've seen one of Nate's boards, they are, they literally look like a NASCAR of surfboard. <laughs> That's they, my He's goal. like, I need the biggest stickers I can get. <laughs> I love stickers. <laughs> you guys got stickers sent them to me. <laughs> <laughs> He'll ref your sticker for free. <laughs> <laughs> for, I'll pay you. <laughs> $1. Venmo Nate, a dollar. He'll ref your sticker. Uh, I love stickers. It is funny. I you do have the most stickered surfboard in surfing, I think. And and it comes back to that. Like to me, it's like when I lock in with a brand, like I'm fired up and yeah. I want to represent them. I want to back them. I want them to back me. I want everyone to be hyped. I want the relationship to be good and smooth. And it just comes from that when we were younger, like. Dude, I, I don't care what you're like. Just give me, give me some cash and let me go on the road and do my thing. Yeah. And then look where we are now. Like it's, it was like the, it was investing back into yourself. Yeah. My dude, my first Quicksilver deal was like, it was either Chad Wells put me on Quicksilver when I was seventeen. I think my first deal was like two hundred or five hundred bucks a month, and I was literally applying for a job at Lele as a local restaurant. And the next day after I applied, Chad Wells was at my house. He's like, I got a contract for you. I was just like, I didn't what even a care of events. if it was, I was going to take that deal, even if it was just flow product. Yep. And it ended up working out. I've been with Quicksilver yep. for, I guess, almost over 12 years now. Yep. And you've been with Vans for how long? Pretty much nearly 
pretty much 18 years right around there oh my Long god time. 18 coming years up on 20 years with vans so they were your first yeah spot you didn't like bounce I, around sponsors at all Ooh, I had we we were as like a trilogy on O'Neill for a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, but that's then that's the company I was trying to remember. We had Van Shoes as shoes back then. They did more um, where they would sponsor guys just for shoes. Yeah, and then John continued with O'Neill and Vans and had introduced. Hey, we want we don't want to just do like the shoes on guys. We want to do head to toe, and they offered Ivan and I that, and then John had like gone with O'Neill and we were like, I was just like, like, obviously as a girl, I was so psyched. Yeah. You know, like, like I, oh I my just, God, this surf brand wants to sponsor me. To me, it felt like the deal with O'Neill was based off John. It was like, they wanted John, but I think my mom was pretty nuts back then. She yeah. was like, okay, you, you can have John, but you got to like help me and Ivan and Nathan like travel around too. And like, give us a little bit of that deal. Yeah. And then, so, that's how that worked. But so when Vans came along and they were like, no, we want you, you head to toe. It just felt like I got my own deal. You know, like I was like, you feel oh. accomplished. Yeah. Like Not I wasn't like, like I wasn't piggybacking. No, yeah. I was like, okay, hey, I'm so fired up to do this. And it was, it was a perfect transition into like, I mean, look at the relationship. I've been with them for 18 years now. So that was like an awesome um, turning point as far as that. But yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Because a lot of people in the surf world are never really with a brand for too long or they get taken from the brand to a different brand. Yeah. Or they just like lose their sponsor. So to be mm-hmm. with a brand, well, you're 28, to be with them since you were 10 years old. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, me too. I've been on Quicksilver for long 12 time. years. Yeah. Long time. I think we're we're very fortunate with the paths we've chosen to be looked at as like okay we're not going to drop that guy especially when all these huge cuts come through the surf world like internally and then the athletes we've somehow just hung on but you know what it's not all luck because yeah, going back right. to what you're saying like maybe you weren't getting paid that much in the beginning and maybe it was almost a flow program but like we did we did the absolute most we could with what we had we were never stagnant yeah um we left this island as much as we could we never yeah. stayed dark for the summer months. You know, we were on the road. Like, our parents are really good at, like, pushing us. Like, no, be active, be busy. They both, like, uh, gave us work ethic to be like, hey, if you are caught sleeping, if you are caught not being the surfer they want you to be or, like, you doing well at your job, when the cuts come, you're going to be the first to go. Yeah. And that happens with guys. You see guys get great deals and get real lazy and be like, oh, I'm not going to answer the call. I'm not going to ask my brand if they need anything. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to take my paychecks and do my thing. And, and I don't even have to surf that much because I'll just wait and go out once in a while. And like, you can just, if you're looking to be a professional surfer and use this as your career, like, you can never be that guy because. There is always that guy on the team, and when the budget cuts come, he's probably going to be the first to get cut. And we, yeah. worked, we worked really hard to not be those guys. And so a lot of times, those years when budget cuts came, we were on the right side of it. Yeah, luckily. And now with like YouTube and social media, it's just like good choices. Yeah, I good would choices. Say. Um, we got an epic tale here from... Daryl Lavor, sixty nine thirty one. Are you about to read a story? Yeah, I'm going to read a little story, but it ends with a question. <laughs> Had a question for you guys. Maybe you could discuss this on the podcast. Um, back in 1977 or 78, my friends and I were driving from town to surf country on a late Friday afternoon and were hyped to surf. There was a big swell hitting that night. We headed out to log cabins just before sunset. It was already pumping, barely rideable at logs. We said, what the hell, let's hit it and catch a few before dark. The swell fully hit while we were out there. We kept on paddling out to dodge the bombs and wound up in a dar- in the dark and it was huge. We contemplated the paddle to Waimea and tried to go in there. But I remember the story of the, the guy who tried that and they never saw his body again. So I said, screw it, I'm catching anything out here and riding in. My friends and I all made it to shore, but it was super scary. Has anything like that happened to you or your friends? It's the classic <laughs> story of like here in Hawaii, I mean anywhere, but here in Hawaii, we've seen swells pick up 
in an hour. Yeah. Like zero to a hundred super, super quick and people be caught like that. Yeah. Every pipe. So every day at pipe, this, you'll be watching the sunset and all of a sudden the sun's going down and it's pitch black and you're like, I just seen 10 people still out there. Yeah. Like, I don't know like if they're going to be making it in mm-hmm. or not. We, we like, have rescued people oh, from yeah. that exact, like coming in from pipe. I remember one year, I forget which Grom it was. Uh, it was one of the Groms that now like a, an actual a surfer, but he was super young at the time. You got to call him out. You got to remember his name. I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember his name. <laughs> I'll remember at some point, but I was going in um, at pipe and it was just like that. It was dark, big rising swell. And there's that current that rips out out through the gums channel and so like you might think like oh i don't want to get too close to pipe if you're new out there because it's big i'm going to edge towards like uh, gums and go in there but little do you know all of the power of pipe flushes in and then yanks back out by gums and aokai it's be even worse current. Mm-hmm. and so i was like heading in there was like maybe everyone was catching waves in like there was like no one in the water left and i look out and i just see this grom like 12 or 13 crying <laughs> In tears and in this in the current and at the point of calling for help, kind of he was like he was like I can't get in I can't get in he was just going out in the current and I looked around and there was like someone had just been there and they had just turned around and gone and I in and I was like bro like <laughs> hello like you guys keep your keep your surroundings like keep your eye on the surroundings like you never know be when someone's gonna be totally like the guy just bailed and I'm like it was the kid was in obvious distress. Um, I paddled out to him and he was terrified, absolutely terrified. It was dark. It was huge. And he was stuck in the rip current. And I was like, man, it's all good. Just calm down. Waited for a lull, paddled him real close to pipe on that inside. And we just caught a small one, you know, in, in between that channel. Yeah. You time it right. You can catch a small one. But I guess for advice on that story, like I, me and Co have probably been in a situation like that, but also we were introduced to heavy water so young that yeah. that would have happened when we were we're pretty young. And by the time we were 14, 15, we were like uh, veterans in that type of situation, as well as kind of knowing to not get stuck in that situation, like to call it early enough and to, yeah. to get out of there. But if yeah. I, if I stayed out for too long and like the sun, it was like almost dark, even on a small day. I'd be getting yelled at by my dad. Oh, yeah. You'd be getting yelled at for sure. So snap. Yeah. So that's why I was like, even now, I'm like, oh, the sun's almost down. I should probably go in. It's like instinctive. Yeah. Where I'm like, I could catch a couple, but I'm like, ah, I don't want to get stuck out here. Yeah. But like, if if you ever find yourself in that situation, the best thing you can do, I would say, especially if you're at a heavy wave, would be wait out a set. And as soon as that set seems like it mellows out, I would start... Just booking it in into mm-hmm. like the least currency place, and hopefully just catch like a tiny little ripple. But just start paddling in as hard like as hard as you can to get away from that impact zone and closer to shore, where you can maybe even catch a whitewash. I would advise the same thing. You always want to use the the wave's energy and the direction it's going. Right, like there might be a channel, but is the current ripping out to sea there versus if you just paddle yourself into the white water, that energy is going towards the beach. It's going to take you towards the beach, even though you might get a little bit worked. Um, but that's a classic novice error is there's the channel. I'm got to get in in the channel, but the channel is usually where all the current is ripping out. If there's, if you're in big, heavy conditions, some channels are better than others. Obviously it's spot specific, but for the most part, the channel is where that current rips out because the way of breaking pushes all that energy into shore and then it cranks back out. So we're always using the waves to our advantage, whether we're just out surfing them or we're using them to get in and vice versa going out. We'll often jump into the rip current on a paddle out because we know it's just yeah. going to give us the turbo Mario Kart lane straight out to, yeah. the, to the lineup. Take out the pipe every time. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of the same with anything in surfing. If you're not, if you're on, like, the saying I think we've brought up before, but just like, if in doubt, don't go out. That's you know? it. And if you are out there, <laughs> it's very simple. And you're, you're not in by the time the sun's setting, and you're not super experienced. It's a new place. Like just come in. Like if I say you're at, even me, say it's your first time to Puerto Escondido. Yep. You don't usually surf in the evening. This is, might be a bad example, but say you're out there in the evening, the sun's going down, your first session ever out there. Like, are you going to stay out till dark to catch another one? 
Like I'd go in. I would go in f- straight. Like even with my skill level now, if it's yep. like a solid day for me, I would be like, because I don't know the place, I'm not gonna risk getting stuck out here. No. And if like, something happened in the dark, your yeah. chances are just that much lower of like it's just over. Like there's no one out anymore to look after you. Yeah. That's another thing too. Never be afraid to like. Like we can tell when someone is in a situation in the water. And very rarely do they actually like look around and be like, hey, I need help. Yeah. But like was... drop the ego and just be like, like if you ever like if you're in that situation and you see someone more knowledgeable than you, just be like, hey man, I'm kind of tripped out on going in. Like, could you show me where to go in or how to get in or even like help me get in? Like if someone mm-hmm. asks me that, I'm like, 100 percent man, I got yeah. you. I'm gonna get you to shore. But oftentimes it's us being paddling over and being like, Hey, pal, you You look like you're kind of struggling. (laughs) No, I'm fine. Mm, I don't think you are. So they're like (laughs) flat side of the head is on the surfboard. And they're just like, like, oh, man, here we go. It's time to go. (laughs) But I think that's a good thing to bring up is just ask questions. Sometimes you might like, depending on where you are, you might get made fun of or whatever, tease a little bit, but it's not, it's okay to ask questions. It totally is. And that's just part of learning too. Yeah. You'll know next time. Some yeah, that's the best thing you can do is just ask questions. Especially with new spots. Like, for example, Tahiti. When we're just in Tahiti, when you fall on a wave and you know there's more sets behind, you don't go with the current because it would take you to a very it's dangerous the worst spot, spot. you'd be in. And it, it feels like it might you might be coming out of the impact zone yeah. the way it's pulling you if you didn't know. But really you want to paddle way deeper and the opposite way because if you don't you could end up in like the worst place ever in surfing yeah so it's all about just knowing and asking questions about the spot you're going to so you don't get stuck in like a hectic situation like that because people can die you get lost they do die especially at nighttime yep just like that guy um i remember the story he's talking about of the guy that they were out at sunset i think it was it got huge some of the guys went in and one of the guys was like, I'm going to go in at Waimea. So like there's places here on North Shore where it's obviously we have this eight miles of all these different waves, right? But some may be easier to get in than others. But when the waves are really big, we have these outer reefs and not all of those are set. Like they're big playing fields of reefs. So you never, if it's really big, you don't know where waves are going to break. And I guess someone had supposedly decided they were going to go from sunset to Waimea, which is probably, what, two miles away? Oh, my God. In a giant swell thinking, oh, Waimea has the big bay. I'll get in that channel, which, if it's really big, it's closing out, and it would be an absolute nightmare in the dark. Yeah, Waimea shore break is just as bad. I don't know. So would Sunset. That sunset. would be a very, very scary predicament to be in God. on North Shore specifically <sighs> because there isn't really, like, when it's real big, there's no calm spot to get in, and if it's there's like the biggest channels, the Haleiwa Channel, Waimea, Sunset, huge rip currents. Your safest bet is for sure just trying to get a wave in. Yeah. Well, that's just back to if in doubt, don't go out because I know and you know if you're going out somewhere, you know you're getting back in at that spot. Like yeah. I don't care how big it is. I'm going to make it to the shore no matter what time of day or night. Yeah. Like I'm making it no matter mm-hmm. what. So like... But if I was somewhere that was new, I definitely would just be careful. I had cautious. that happen in Scotland where I went out and I, what I didn't factor in was the tides. Were you in doubt? You know what? I kind of <laughs> was in doubt and I probably shouldn't have gone doubt, out. Don't go out. <laughs> but I, I just was like, I, there was such good waves. In, and I, it was one of the things where you get in the water and you realize like, okay, it's three times the size I thought it was. Like, oh, shoot. But the main thing was there was a keyhole paddle out, which was terrifying. It wasn't the keyhole I thought it was. Uh, but I got out. We got out. And here, there, in different countries, there's huge tide moves. And so the tide had gotten super, um, super pulled out. It was way shallower. But it caused the keyhole to just disappear. It was just giant surges across <laughs> the channel. And I was like... And, and and the I was with a kid and he was like, well, should we try the keyhole? And I was looking and I was like, zero chance. It's fifteen foot. He's from there. 
Yeah, he's he's from there. And Did he not know? He didn't know what to do. No, <laughs> I was like, uh, you're like, the- oh, someone to ask a question from here. <laughs> what do I do? And he's like, I don't know, man. I was gonna ask you. <laughs> he, he was a grom though, and I was like, he's like, should we try here? And I'm like, no, nah, man, let's go. We paddled like half a mile down the coast in front of these rocks. But I knew generally I could see that it turned into this big bay. Uh-huh. I was just hoping. Hoping in that big bay would be less energy, and it totally was. It ended up being totally fine, but but that paddle was long and spooky, and it was kind of one of those things where you just you're just preparing for like, all right, like if this doesn't turn out to what I think it is, I'm gonna be uh, tumbling over those rocks for real quick. Yeah, like you would have <laughs> like made I'm, it. I'm making it, 100. Yeah. Yeah, no percent. It's what. just um, how gently am I gonna make it <laughs> yeah. in? Am I going to be okay after I get in? Yeah. It's questionable. What was Zord thinking? Was Zord filming? Zord wasn't filming. Mahina was. Oh, my God. Did she call, like... Mahina... She called the cops. Mahina just just stayed true to cameraman, just didn't stop recording. <laughs> she just was like... I, got, I, I think she has so much confidence in me. Confidence in me. She was like unsure if it was a situation or not a situation. <laughs> so she like, was like, she's like, this is my... Her husband's the best big wave surfer in the world. <laughs> like, he's, he's, fine. he's fine. He's got it. He's With not me panicking. Inside, like internally panicking. Like this is not good. This is not good. But uh, she like went. She did go running all the way to the base of the bay, and I came in and I had to yell to her like, "Mahina, like come back this way. Like we're fine. We're good." But what was interesting was like the kid I was with. Um, he was like. I don't know if they just, he, he looked like he got, started to become like exhausted. We had surfed for like two and a half hours. Yeah. But like my adrenaline's pumping. I'm like feeling fit. Like I'm making it in. I'm feeling strong right now. And I, I could see him, his paddle was getting slower and slower. And I was like, I was like, I wonder if he knows the situation right now. Like, like we got to move. I don't know if this swell's getting bigger. It's time <laughs> yeah. to like go. It's time and to so paddle, I had to like turn around and be like, hey, hey, buddy. No, let's pick up the pace. Like, <laughs> we're not going to cruise along here. Like, we're jamming. Yeah. And he picked up the pace, and he's just like, whoa. That was hectic, but he's, he's, like, he's a good kid. I can't go any faster. No, yeah, he's, he's fired up. And so it's just one of those funny things. We've been in that situation, too, where one of the older guys puts us into some heavy water, and we're like, are we good? They're like, you're good. But like, yeah, you're fine. We never really know what they were thinking, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, shit. They're like, oh, <laughs> shit, this is a little heavy. Hey, uh, so maybe <laughs> don't tell your parents about the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, really? That's funny. Yeah. Like, I think on our first podcast we ever put out, our Himalaya session, Yeah. when we got caught inside and whatever, we explained the story, but I just remember a couple of the older guys having to, like, Calm me down a little bit yeah. after like the first two on the head when I was young. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, oh, and they're like, it's gonna be okay. Yeah. You're gonna be fine, Grom. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know. There's more coming. <laughs> like, yeah. get me out of here. Like, are we? Like, yeah, yeah, it's good. They're like, oh shit. Yeah, like us now, I'd be cracking up I'd if I just it. saw some Grom just at the reef like, oh. Just eyeballs huge. Yeah. I'd stick with them, but be like, you're gonna be fine. Yeah. It's funny. Well, we're at uh, 53 minutes here. We'll wrap it up. I mean, the, the quote of the podcast, if in doubt, don't go out. <laughs> yeah. Tell your kids. Tell yourself. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next one, episode 16. Co, tell them what to do. Oh, like this video and subscribe <laughs> to our chat. <laughs> Threw me off there. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are listening on Spotify or Apple, um, I think you can subscribe on there. I'm not sure how it works. Yeah. But if you're on YouTube, like this video, subscribe to our channel, leave a comment asking a question or anything, and we'll try to get it answered for you. We're trying to get through a bunch of comments. There's so many on every video, but we are definitely trying to read them. Stories, and too. We love the stories. Like That yeah. was a great story about that guy. Like, you guys got your own situation and stories. Tell them in the comments, and then we'll give you a breakdown of your own story. Yeah, and again, whoever you'd like to see on here, we got a couple people coming on and more people that we're reaching out to that want to come on and we'll keep pushing out these podcasts. So subscribe. Nate and Coa podcast. Over and out. See ya.